Um, I do want to talk today about the future. This is not something I've talked about before, so I'll get much of it wrong, I'm sure, because I think we are living through a reframing of, of the future, a change in our basic idea of what it is and how it works. Um, this happens occasionally, not for the future, in a few thousand years, though. And so I think this is a, what's happening is a big deal. It, it shows itself in our casual acceptance of, for example, hackathons. Um, yep, a call back to the comedian. Um, but <clears throat> we all agree. I, there are, a hackathon is an amazing thing we take them for granted, that we'll throw people together in a room for 30 hours, as yesterday, and 28 new applications, unplanned and unintended, will emerge. That's really not normal, and it's really uh, wonderful. So hackathons, one example. Another example is the internet itself, um, which has succeeded despite the expectations put on it by governments and by corporations who think they know what the internet is for and want to optimize it for their vision of what it's for. And we've managed so far to avoid that. I hope we will continue to do so, because the internet is for whatever we, it's our internet. It's for whatever we imagine. And we, we will never stop imagining things we can do with it. So that's not normal either, and that's a really good thing. So um, we can now see that we have been hacking the future for a long, long time. You, you can see that you know, making the best of, of a bad situation. And we can see this with, for example, the Swiss Army knife, which is a wonderful little tool. And you add some more blades, it gets even better. You add some more blades, and it's getting really great. And so you keep going, and you end up with this fabulous tool. This is a real thing. This is the Wenger 16999. It will set you back 885 euros. Shipping is free on Amazon if you're a Prime member. 87 blades, and it covers everything that you would want to do. It's got all of your golfing tools. It's got your fishing tools. It's got your cigar smoking tools. It's got your gun tools. This is an entire lifestyle packaged up into a small package. It's really quite amazing, but it makes clear to us what the problem has been with our way of, of dealing with the future. And we can see this if we imagine that we have the Star Trek replicators, and they're portable, and they're, we carry them with us whenever we go. And you say, you know, I'd really, right now, I'd like a 1.5 millimeter Phillips head screwdriver. And if you press the button and it delivered that, but then also added, let's say, a pair of pliers and a chainsaw, you would not say, oh, good, have all these things attached at the handle. You'd say, call in the replicator repair person, because this thing is really, really broken. Nobody wants this. But this is what we do when we hack the future with Swiss Army knives and basically everything else that we build. But it's because that we, we don't have replicators, and it's because physics really sucks that we have to do things like bundle a set of tools together into a pocket-sized uh, implement. And so what's holding these, these tools together is anticipation, our anticipation of what will be useful tools. And this is something that we have done for 10,000 years. It's one of the two most basic ways that we approach the future, which is to say, well, we have some perceived need, and so we, we're going to need this thing in the future, so we go ahead and build it. And then we hold on to the tool for as long as we possibly can, because we want to extract the maximum value from it. And obviously, we do this all the time. We've done it throughout our history. And we certainly do it in the realm of, of software as well. Computers did not eliminate this need. So this, this is the library that I work in. And we have a project called Library Cloud, which is a, uh, we gather up lots of metadata from lots of different libraries, and we make it available through an API. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So it's great. really like it. And we're very happy to have uh, groups come to us and say, well, you, we'd like to put our metadata in to make it publicly available. So a couple of months ago, the Tibetan Buddhist Research Resource Center, which is in Cambridge, uh, where we are, came by and said, we have 10 million records. Would you like them, we, the metadata? And we said, absolutely, of course we would. And so we did the usual thing of taking their metadata, their way of labeling their fields, matching it up with ours. And it's pretty straightforward, because we have a schema. That is, we have anticipated what the uh, categories will be that are interesting that we're going to record. And one of them is creators. And their records have creators. And we have dates. They have dates. And a very straightforward thing until we got to the part where they said, you know, there's one more field that's really important within our domain of Tibetan Buddhist historical records, which is um, 
reincarnation. Who is the author of reincarnation of? And surprisingly, we had not anticipated that. We, we, did, we just didn't think that through. And so we were stuck. And it's not too hard a problem to solve. We resolved it. Nevertheless, the point is that even in the world of software, we are constantly anticipating what we think people will be, need, will be needing, and thus we are constantly disappointing people. We're doing the best we can, but it's a limitation that we've had on the future itself. So anticipation is one of the characteristics of the future, uh, of the old and current model of the future. The second is that we think about the future in our culture generally often as a landscape that we are driving through or walking through. And the stuff far away from us is indistinct. The possibilities are many, many possibilities. They're quite indistinct. And as we move through this landscape and come closer to those possibilities, they narrow. We have fewer and fewer the closer those possibilities come. The future narrows possibilities. And that's just the way that it's been. So the two prime characteristics of the future that I'm going to talk about this morning of our old idea of the future is that it anticipates and it narrows the possibilities. But now we are in a new age. Things are changing. And so I want to look at some of the places we can see this change in our idea of the future already. And all of these are familiar. You, you will know all of these. Um, the first is in the realm of filtering. So in the old days, book publishing, magazine publishing, you get many more articles or books than you can publish. Very few of them, one of them makes it through. The rest do not. They don't get published. And then they go dark. You cannot find them, no matter how much. You don't even know they're there. You don't even know to look for them, because they didn't get published. And that's just the way it was. Was. Now, everything gets posted. It all gets published. So uh, much more stuff is there. We are still filtering, though. Of course, we have to, because there's way, way too much stuff. So of course we filter, but we don't filter out. We filter forward. So you filter by taking a link and posting it on Twitter or in a blog post or Facebook or wherever you're going to do it. And in so doing, all that you're really doing there is shortening the number of clicks it takes for your readers to get to that thing. Everything else is still there, still fully available, might show up in somebody else's Google search or blog post or tweet. Nothing is removed. We are only filtering forward, which means that we now have a general approach, a general strategy. You see this all over the net, which is to, well, when in doubt, include it all. And we'll let the filtering occur on the way out, because that lets people filter according to their own needs and their own interests, not the needs and interests that we anticipated in good faith, but when we anticipate, we cut out stuff that we did not anticipate would be of value. The second place that I think we can see some of this new uh, future emerging is in the nature of topics. So if it's 1911 and you are looking at the Encyclopedia Britannica, which was the great English language uh, encyclopedia, stopped publishing in print a year ago, I think, or so. If you look at the 1911 edition at the English uh, author Oliver Goldsmith, 6,000 words by a very well-known historian. You look at the 1961 edition and it's been cut in half. You look at the 1994 edition, cut in half, which means Britannica was in the business of throwing out information. They didn't like it, but they had to do it because the encyclopedia could be this big, but not this big. And so encyclopedias and libraries have had to throw out information, which is a scandal and a shame. It was the right thing to do. And in doing so, they had to anticipate what they thought their readers will, would most want. What one-third of this article will we preserve? So now you go to Wikipedia, you look up Oliver Goldsmith. It's only 50, a 1,400-word article, so it's actually shorter, but it has hundreds of hyperlinks. This one has dozens of hyperlinks. Wikipedia articles are full, obviously, of links. So if you want to do the side-by-side -side comparison, who has more about Oliver Goldsmith, the 1994 Britannica, or Wikipedia, you're going to have to start clicking links. Maybe you'll click on the Vicar of Wakefield link, which is one of the books that he wrote, and maybe you'll count that in the word count. Maybe you won't. And that article itself has tons of links in it. You're going to have to figure out what links count for the topic of Oliver Goldsmith. And no two people are going to agree. We're just not, because we don't agree about anything. It seems to me, first of all, that Goldsmith on Wikipedia as a topic is a web. It's not an article that starts here and ends here. It's a web. And this is true on the web, of course, as well, not just Wikipedia. 
And second of all, that new shape of topics as webs it seems to me to be a more accurate reflection of the nature of, of topics, that the old paper-based view tried to squeeze them in an unnatural way, and the web is letting them relax into their real shape. This means that we don't define a topic by anticipating and confining it. In fact, the, the very apotheosis of, of anticipation and narrowness is the book. I say this is somebody who writes books, so don't get too angry at me yet, but if you write books or even if you read books, you know that this is true. I'm saying something very simple, that you have to figure out what limit, because you have such limited space, you have to anticipate what the reader is going to be interested in. You can't cover it all. And because it's a disconnected medium, just physically disconnected, as an author, you have to figure out uh, what your readers are likely to already know and what you have to tell them, how much you anticipate what they know. You can't get everything in, so you have to do that sort of anticipation. And then you give them a narrow path. The book consists of a narrow, well, we hope, well-constructed path that keeps the reader going from A to Z in the way that you want them to. This is an art, but it's also an art that's based upon a limitation. So books exhibit this, this confluence of having to anticipate and having to keep things really, really narrow. The next place where we see this new sort of unanticipated future emerges in big data, which is substantially different than old data. It's not just old data, and now we have more of it. The, the idea behind old data in the computer age was that there was very, we had very little capacity. And so we, we ruthlessly, ruthlessly decided what we were going to put into our database, and everything else got left out. Big data isn't like that. Big data is about inclusiveness. When in doubt, include it, because we can't anticipate what data will turn out to be meaningful. That's where the value of big data comes from, from this lack of recognition of impossibility of anticipating what we're going to find. So include it all. Um, 